The next presentation is going to be a bit different than we've done before. It's going to be a di bit different than the way we did it in Daytona. Our next speaker and presenter is Marilyn Smith, Huntsville, Arkansas. Kingston, Kingston Arkansas. Kingston. Oh, yeah, Kingston, Arkansas. We've got Kingston. so many Arkansas people Kingston, here. Huntsville. And Georgia people. It kind of tr I have trouble keeping those uh, names straight. From Kingston, Arkansas. Last time, uh, as she uh, was with us in Daytona, we ended the presentation with some questions from the audience, as we do most of the time. I was a little itching to w ask some questions, but I didn't want to get really, you know, arrogant and pushy, so I didn't really try to take over the questions. Today, I guess I'll get arrogant and pushy. I want to start, primarily start the whole thing with some questions that I would like to ask Thomas Jefferson myself. You might want to join in with me afterwards, but there's a number of things I've, uh, I've wanted to ask for a long time, and she's agreed to this method of starting. So it's going to be started on as an interview. After, she will give you a very few minutes of how she got to where she is now and how she, she is able to do what she is able to do. So I'm going to sit down over here, and when she finishes, she can sit down next to me with her microphone, and I can ask her questions. And I think uh, we'll find out perhaps some interesting things. And if you have questions after that, you might want to also. So without any further ado, will you welcome Marilyn Smith from Kingston, Arkansas, who will bring us our presentation today. I'm on now, right? Yes, I am. I can tell. Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here again. We are going to try something different today. Since most of you were not in Daytona, I'll give you a little bit of background on how I arrived at this uh, interesting situation because it was something that I never expected or anticipated. I've never had any interest in politics, government, IRS, or any of that. I just was considered myself an ordinary person, but I've always had a desire for knowledge. I am like Thomas Jefferson in one way, is that I've been a continual seeker of knowledge all my life. I want to know all there is to know about everything. Well, you know the saying, be careful what you ask for, you're going to get it? Boy, did I ever. <laughs> a lot more than I ever anticipated. But a number of years ago, I had some wonderful spiritual experiences, and thing, one thing led to another, and I started studying and reading and going to classes. Uh, still not having any idea where this would lead. I went to a school and studied uh, philosophical type and philosophy in Houston. I am a pharmacist, so I have a background in medicine, alternative medicine, and about everything else you can think of. One day in 1977, I was reading and I heard a voice in my head. It sounded like an electronic tape recorder sort of thing. And it really surprises me now, looking back on it, that I paid attention to it. And this voice said, get in your car and go look for property. Well, I sat there and thought, well, something's wrong here. What's this? You know, I didn't pay any attention. Went back to my book. A minute later, here comes this little voice again. Get in your car and go look for property. Well, I had in mind about building a house that I had designed myself, but hadn't done anything about it yet. And I thought, well, hmm. And I tried to read again. And then the voice said, look, it's a beautiful day out. It's not going to hurt anything. Go get in your car and look for property. So I thought, well, I'm not getting anywhere. So I got up and got out in my car and thought, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. But I got in the car and started driving. And I was guided a few miles away from where I lived at that time to a side street kind of out in the middle of nowhere in the outskirts of Houston. And it was a beautiful piece of property that was for sale. It was kind of hidden back in the woods, very secluded. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is the perfect place to build a house. So to make a long story short, I bought the property, built the house, which took several years because everything you could think of went wrong. So after four years and four lawyers and a few other things, I got the house built. 
as time went on, I didn't, I was studying more metaphysical and spiritual things and I learned to communicate with other dimensions in the spirit world and uh, the angels and the ascended masters and the divas and the animals and all of this and I have a great love for gardening and the flowers and the plants is my strong connection. And then after that, I knew or received messages that I was to someday build a retreat that would demonstrate create beautiful gardens that would demonstrate the beauty and the joy of life when you live and work in harmony with all life and all beings. And then I got a message uh, sometime after that to move. And I ended up on a mountain in remote Arkansas, out in the middle of nowhere. It was at that point that I began being in contact with Thomas Jefferson. Now, I had no idea of where this was going. I knew of his interest in gardening, and I'd always had a fascination for well, his writings and his philosophy, but I didn't expect there to be anything behind that. And then when I thought I was hearing from him, and I thought, no, 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 that can't be. I'm imagining it. I must be crazy. And then people I know who are psychic, I have several friends who can see and have abilities, and they would tell me, there's Thomas Jefferson standing behind you, or he's over here, or he's over there. And I thought, what on earth? And it didn't click with me until several years later. That voice that I heard when I was told to look for property the first time. It was in 1977, and I didn't connect with the purpose behind it until I realized not too long ago that it was on July the 4th that this occurred. And I went, oh. Anyway, when I did hear from him, I was working with him on communication, but it was all about the garden and the plants. So I thought, oh, good. He's just going to work with me because of his love of gardening, and somebody else can work with the government, because I didn't want to deal with that. But I didn't really know there was a problem at that time. <laughs> then little by little, books kept falling off the shelf, and something would pop up in front of me, and I would find a magazine, and I would hear something. And I began thinking, hey, what, what, what's going on about the government here? And then I started studying and reading the material that the previous speaker uh, spoke on. I found out about the IRS. I found out about the Federal Reserve, the banking system, and I got very, very angry and very upset. And about, the, about this time, the next time I heard from Jefferson, this is what he talked about. And he said, I couldn't say anything until I knew that you were aware and you would agree to work with me on this because I want you to help wake the American people up to what is going on because the government, the way it was meant to be, has been destroyed and I want people to know. So, oh boy. <laughs> I thought I was thought I just came up here to do a garden. I didn't know there was going to be anything else like this involved. So anyway, I did have trouble accepting and believing a lot of this. So I went to Monticello, I went to Washington. I had a wonderful experience at the Jefferson Memorial where I felt his presence very strongly. And I was guided to take a photograph of the Jefferson Memorial of his statue. And I had a real wonderful, when I, when I work with him, I feel such a love and such a joy that sometimes I get choked up because the feeling is so beautiful and so strong. But I took a picture. I just knew I had to take a picture of his statue by itself. And I was very surprised when the picture came out because it has a beautiful spiral of white light energy through it to show me that I wasn't imagining who I was communicating with because I was having difficulty believing it. So I don't channel like maybe some people that you have heard. When I first started, it was telepathic uh, and through here. But then as time went on, and I w did a lot of work on myself, a lot of spiritual work, went through a lot of problems and difficulties, you know, like some of the previous speakers have mentioned, you know, I left my home behind in Houston, every lost everything I had, moved away, just said goodbye, and, you know, left everything behind to do my work. And the, uh, I forgot where I was, right in mid-sentence. What was it she was saying this morning about losing your memory? Boy, just like that. I know I do it all the time. But anyway, I realized that I was going to accept 
what he wanted me to do. Well, the reason for the channeling the way I do, it has taken me many years to develop this because one of the things he hopes to do, not everyone in the country is open to channeling or understands what is really behind the spiritual nature. And that, because I thought of myself as a spiritual teacher, not a channeler. So I have developed the ability where it becomes more like a merger and it's more like a heart I don't know how to describe it, but it comes from here and through the heart. And sometimes I feel his love. And he's very passionate about freedom. And the love that I feel is so strong, sometimes it's hard to talk because if you see tears, it's not tears of sadness, it's tears of joy. So I wanted you to understand that because sometimes my words get kind of stuck in my throat. And I think that's all I need to say so we can start. Okay, if you're ready, whenever. Let me sit here for a moment. Good afternoon, Mr. Jefferson. Good afternoon, my friend. First thing I want to ask you is, how do you prefer to be addressed? Is it President Jefferson, uh, uh, or Mr. Jefferson, or just plain Tom? My friends call me Tom. You may call me Tom or Mr. Jefferson, but not Mr. President. All right, thank you very much. There's a number of things I'd like to find out that you can tell me. When you did the Louisiana Purchase, which I think was probably the biggest real estate deal in history. Were you given a lot of criticism in Congress? Not as much as I expected. There was some, but then they were those of us who had worked together for a long time and we knew one another very well. Were you accused of using power that you really didn't have? I don't. It did come up, but I don't think accused would be the right word. It was discussed. And it was really difficult for me to explain to them myself mm -hmm. because some of the things that occurred with me were difficult for me to talk about because a lot of what I did was the result of what you might call a vision or something in that nature. And I considered myself a very logical person and was very embarrassed to tell anyone any other experiences that I had. You might call them metaphysical experiences? I would now. I wouldn't then. <laughs> All right. In, in writing the Declaration of Independence, did you have any help? Definitely. That was not for me. Can you tell us some, some of the ones who helped you? I didn't know their names at the time, but I know that as I wrote and studied, I would receive a name or a message. Part of it was a result of all my years of searching for knowledge and studying philosophers. I think governments should be created by people who are philosophers, statesmen, the type of person who really has looked into history and studied all of the, what you would call classical education that has a broad range of knowledge. So I, as my background of studying all, I read the philosophies of the ancients in the original languages whenever possible. So I took bits and pieces from their knowledge, from things I read. And as I read, I had a lot of books always had books around me and I would feel an urge to a particular book or a particular title or to a name and I would know that there was something in there and sometimes I would open a book and it would fall open to a particular page and I would recognize that it had something to do with what I was thinking or the concept. At any, uh, at any time uh, in your lifetime, did you have the uh, opportunity to meet King George personally? No, I didn't. Okay. 
in the, uh, did you have any part in writing the, in the, the Constitution? Not, not in writing it. I was in France at the time. Uh -huh. But I did communicate by letter with the friends in there, and I would make suggestions and ideas and comments, but I actually could not say that I wrote it. Okay, could you tell us how you got along with Alexander Hamilton? Well, we agreed to disagree. We did, we had, we did not got, get along, I'm sorry to say. However, it was not a personal nature. We both had a totally different belief or philosophy of how government should be, and there was a total conflict. What was his, uh, what would have been his, what was he trying to do? At the risk of sounding critical, I was, would say he was trying to create what we have now. How, I think we could certainly agree with that. How about uh, Ben Franklin? What can you tell us about him? What kind of a person was he? He was quite a character. He was a very highly intelligent person. He had a wide range of knowledge. I respected and admired him tremendously. His, his mind, he had a very sharp mind and a very sharp wit. And a love of the ladies and companionship. And he was quite a, uh, he did not lead a dull life. <laughs> you took that question right out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> How about George Washington, his personality? He was a very disciplined, rather stern man. I got along with him most of the time. We did have some disagreements, but I had a great deal of respect for him. He was very disciplined, orderly. Uh, we did disagree on some things, but in general, I had a very high regard for him. He had the type of leadership capabilities that just made people want to follow him. He was a good choice. Well, our former speaker this afternoon mentioned the uh, Treaty of uh, uh, 1980 or 1783 with England. Did you have any uh, part in that negotiation of that treaty? No, his mention of it now is the first that I have heard of it. Oh, okay. Now then, uh, uh, you've been, uh, of course, uh, said uh, many much uh, has been written about by the critics, I would say, perhaps, uh, that you were involved in having slavery. Can you tell us, in having slaves, uh, did you, um, were any of the uh, slaves that first came to this country white? Yes. Uh, none that I knew, but from the previous, from the earlier years, they actually have come from all over the world. Slavery is not a new thing, and it's not all from Africa. It has been the history of civilization to have slaves as what, fortunes of war. When battles were won, then whoever was captured would become slaves. So well, white people have been slaves, black people have been slaves. All of the races have been slaves at one time or another. All the, uh, all the things that are happening in uh, this country today uh, would you see similarities with what you were trying to prevent? Yes. I am very saddened. Excuse me. I know that it is not We tried an experiment. I feel that it has failed. This is very difficult for me and for It's all right. I have always been an idealistic visionary, you might say, 
with rose-colored glasses, but I have a very strong vision of what the world can be. And I was aware that it may or may not work, but I had high hopes. I still have those high hopes. Perhaps some of my rose-colored glasses have worn off to a degree. What I want to do now, there are two reasons that I have wanted to communicate. One is I want my friend here to wake up people, to tell people what has happened in the government. Too many people have not listened, will not listen, have not paid attention. I want to stress the value of getting this information to the public. When I was on the physical plane, I spoke much about education and study and ignorance. I believe I said the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Well, vigilance rather disappeared and people became comfortable and allowed the government to get out of hand. And once it starts, it is very difficult to stop. I do feel now, I'm hoping, I still have some hope that if enough people will stand up and speak out, as many of you here are doing, and as my friend here will do, tell the people, spread the word, awaken them. They are a sleeping public. They must be awakened. If they are not, then they will find out the hard way, the price of their apathy, and lack of attention. If that is the case, then I do feel, because of the things that are coming up in the future, and I know there is much to come, that there is another factor involved in what is coming. I do, I am hopeful that the things that may happen with the government will not fully occur, because there is a spiritual aspect to this. We are having some divine help, intervention, awakenings, all sorts of things are happening and will be happening that when you consider the earthquakes, the earth changes, the other beings from other worlds and everything else that will be coming about in the future, I believe that the country as it is now will not be able to continue with the present government so I want as many people as possible educated with the basic principles of free thinking. So when it is rebuilt, perhaps we can try again to do it the way it was meant to be. What can you tell us about Patrick Henry, his personality, how influenced he was? Did he have any uh, faults or... Uh, what can you tell us about him? Feel free to say whatever you'd like. He was a very passionate man. I would not say he had any faults except perhaps he did have a temper. And sometimes in debate or in speaking, he was very passionate, which is a good thing because you need that kind of passion to awaken people and get them going. But sometimes he would go too far in with a temper and create a disturbance, and that would sometimes be disruptive. But other than that, he was a very dedicated and strong person that I also greatly respected. It seems in those days there was much more respect for one another as a person than I see today. We know uh, from history that you uh, lost uh, Monticello through bankruptcy, uh, can you tell us why you think that happened? There are a number of factors. I did start out life with some money, although I was not wealthy as some of the others were. But in those days, the expenses of the presidency were not covered by taxes. I did not wish to use the money from the people for anything that I felt was my own responsibility. 
So after I retired and returned to Monticello, that was a wonderful time. But because of what had occurred, visitors coming from everywhere, we almost continually had what you call today company. People were staying with us all the time. We did not have the communication and the transportation like you have today. So whenever someone would come, they would always spend a week or two. So the expenses were high. But all of that came from my own, my own expense. I received no money from the government except when I did sell them my books. When you started the, uh, when you found, uh, helped found, or did found the University of Virginia, was that an expense to you? To a small degree it was, yes, but it was the love of my life. Did I you have help? Did you have help founding the, the University of Virginia? Yes. Education and schooling, I think, is the number one important thing that I could talk about. I wanted people to learn and the university was, was my pride and joy. It was more important to me than my presidency, which I don't look on as, as anything that important. To me, the Declaration of Independence and the university were my, were my greatest accomplishments. As you've, uh, as you've observed uh, down through the years, the, is the university continuing in the way that you would have liked to it, uh, it to do? Not as much. None of them are. I would prefer to see a more classical education as I had, but the world has changed, and now most education is geared toward providing a way for people to make a living. I would hope that as my, my friend here did, she also went to school, got a way to make a living, but then did all the other studying on her own. So I would wish that others would also use libraries and use schools and take classes. You don't have to stop studying just because you have graduated from school. I studied all my life, and I still do. Were you a member of the Masonic Lodge? No, I was not. Do you know if George Washington was? Yes, he was. How about Ben Franklin? Yes, he was. Uh, how about, uh, well, let's see, some of the others. Do you know about uh, Patrick ben Henry or? Many of them were, but I don't recall exactly. I wasn't that close over a period of time. Or Hamilton, was Hamilton perhaps? I, I don't know whether he was or not. They didn't talk about that with me very much because they knew my feelings. And uh, were you aware of, of uh, the fact that it appears that they had a lot to do with the uh, layout of Washington, D.C.? I didn't know if the Masonic Lodge had anything to do with it. Okay. Now, would you like to ask about slavery? That is what everybody would want me to ask, I'm sure. To, I have a lot to say about that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yes, I've been waiting for, for it along toward the end for that. Oh, okay. Well, if so you wish I, to wait, that would be all I right. I do want to ask, uh, yes, I do want to ask about slavery and your position on that. And if we might as well get to it. Oh, okay. Now you mean, all right. At the end of this year, they're telling us the DNA tests will be finished regarding yourself and Sally. What can you tell us is going to be the result? <laughs> oh, that is funny. That was, I can't believe that it lasted this long. I didn't say anything at the time. I felt it was a private matter. But no, I did not, that was not a, uh, what would you call it? From my, what I learned with that is that I did have some nephews and relatives living on the property and I feel that probably they were the ones who were involved. <coughs> I have a, if anyone has read, really read what I have written, my personal letters, of which there are many thousands. If you really take the trouble to read what I've written aside from the official documents, you will see that honesty and integrity and my honor has been a very important thing for me. And anyone who has taken the trouble to really read what I've written other than surface 
material, then that should not come up for question. I understand that uh, they're supposed to have DNA tests by the mm -hmm. finished by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. We're getting close to the end of my questions. If you folks have any that you'd like to ask over at the uh, uh, microphone, feel free to do so. Here's one that has been sent in to me. Betsy Ross is the only woman we hear about in connection with that period of time. What role did she play, and is she the only woman who did play a role in that oh, time? No. Actually, the story of the flag is more mythical. Betsy Ross is not, the flag was not created that early in our history. It came along a little later. So a lot of that is part of the image that has been produced in history that is not accurate. There were many women who played a role. One of the ones who played one of the strongest roles, well, two of them, were Abigail Adams and Dolly Madison, uh, women who were the wives of the statesmen played a very important role. Unfortunately, I was not able to have that. I understand. And the folk, you most of you know, you lost your uh, wife when uh, she was well, only 20? About 30. We had been married 10 years. About 30 years old uh, of age, and you lost several Early children. Years. Yes. All but two. All very, very young. The one question I want to get in before the other people have a chance. If you had your, as we call, druthers now, what would you have changed in your life, or what would you have preferred to do if you had the ability to do it over again? <laughs> I would have stayed, I would have read and written and stayed at Monticello, and I know that I did well with the country because I felt a sense of duty and responsibility I would like to have had more time to spend with my family in my home. My years after the presidency were the best because that was where my heart was. Other than that, I don't think I would have changed much. I've been told that you didn't really care for the life in Washington. No. And would rather have been at home. I did not like it at all. On the farm. You might say I was dragged kicking and screaming to Washington. <laughs> you were not a, you were not a, 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 you were a reluctant candidate, can we say? Yes. Basically, I consider myself more a scholar than a student. Uh, perhaps scholar would be the best word, but I am happiest. To me, my greatest joy is to be surrounded with my books and loved ones in my gardens. Why did you take uh, the job as ambassador to France? I wanted to see what the rest of the world was like, so it would help me to bring new things to this country to help it. Mm -hmm. My desire to help people, some people may not realize this, I did make and in develop inventions, but I did not believe in patenting them, which I know is common today but I felt that anything that I created or built or designed for the help of everyone was something that was a gift from God to me and I should give it to the world freely. So I would never, I, nothing that I made was ever patented. Thank you. Now we have a string of people at the microphone and so I'll, I'll ask the first person at the mic to uh, ask your question. Uh, yeah, welcome back to the Earth Plane, Mr. Jefferson. Um, we know that the ETs are working with our governments now. 200 years ago, when you were framing the Constitution, do you have any information you can give us about possible visions or ideas that may have been sent by the ETs? If they were, I wasn't aware of them. I did have some experiences, but at that time, the idea of an ET was something that never really got into. You were living in very exciting times. I wish. Earth now is both a difficult place to be and a very exciting place to be because of all the new discoveries. I don't look on what is coming in the future as a negative thing. I am sorry that we have to make the changes we have to, 
but I don't consider what is coming in the future as doom and gloom. I see it as a cleansing process so we can rebuild everything it was meant to be in the first place. Next question. Good afternoon. Which, with very, very much respect, I would like to ask you, if it is true about the many black mistresses and the black Ill illegitimate children? No. We it, just discussed that a moment ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I oh, did ask that question oh, about I'm Sally Hemming. I didn't hear I that. I have some young nephews, young people on the, there at the same time. Actually, that came about as a result of my angering. Uh, there was a, a person from France who I befriended, and we had some personal difficulties, and he got angry with me because I would not gr give him an appointment that he wanted. I, didn't, I do not approve of the, well, the government now is of giving a favor for a favor. A vote or something in the government should be because it is the best thing to do. So this person wanted me to grant him something and I refused and he became angry. So printed that type of thing. So it's, it's not a big thing for me. He started the story, you're saying? Yes. Oh, was, he, was he a journalist? I see. Uh, no, but he he went to a newspaper and he spread the, and spread the word. Spread. That's what I asked the question about the DNA yeah. about. Because oh, the DNA tests are supposed I to see. be, are but publicized I, to be finished this year. Oh, I see. Okay. Respectfully, thank you very much. Okay. Next question. Thank you. Hello. How are you? I have a major question. Do you have any words for all the children and the families, the Native families that were killed by you and your orders? I did not order any. Do you know anything about why Mush Mount Rushmore was built? Were you there for the reasoning behind it? I beg your pardon? Mount Rushmore, the mountain that has four faces on it. Mount Rushmore. Mount, was Mount Rushmore. I the was long gone by then. South Dakota, the monument, yeah, Mount yeah. Rushmore. What is the, uh, what you, is your question? Uh, what is the reasoning? Do you know the reasoning why your face was put on that mountain? I have no idea. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next question, please. Thanks. Hello. Hello. I, uh, this is almost two parts. One part is, although you say you were not a member of any Masonic lodges, mm -hmm. d you certainly were aware of them. Did you have any mm -hmm. positive or negative feelings relative to the influence of the Illuminati, the Freemasons, or the Knights Templars in the formation of the country, and also in the incorporation of the reverse seal of the, uh, the Great Seal of the United States? Would you run that by again, please? The Great Seal? Uh, oh. Did you have any particular feelings, pro or con, on the, uh, the implication oh, oh. Or, uh, of the, 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 the secret societies oh. in, the, in the formation of the government and also in the, in, uh, the development of the reverse of the Great Seal of oh. the United States? Okay. I understand your question now. Yes and no. There are several answers to that question. I was not privy to what the Masons were doing. I did not belong to them at the time. However, a lot of information that has been published about that, I feel is disinformation too. There's a mixture of, of both information and disinformation. A lot of it is a matter of perspective. I don't know whether it is just my own uh, naivety or whether it's a matter of perspective on the way certain words are used. One of the things I have come across is people have commented on the uh, symbolism of saying a new order of the ages. That has been interpreted to mean the new world order. I wish to clarify at least my perspective on this because to my way of thinking at that period in time I thought that creating a country with freedom of religion and freedom of speech, you know, and the as we did, I thought that that was the new world order. To my way, my perspective of looking at it. Now, 200 and something years later, it appears that it has changed, or there may be two ways of looking at it, or two new world orders. There is, to me, 
building the world that it is meant to be with everyone living together in harmony without war, in loving one another, is a new world. And that's what I thought we were creating back then. So that was my interpretation of what was done with that. Thank you. And mm -hmm. along that line, do you have any specific suggestions for us today for actions to take to help restore our individual sovereignty? Yes. Claim it all you can. Study, learn, speak up. I do think it is past time where just writing to Congress is not going to work. I would ask all of you to do all you can to claim your sovereignty, write letters. The income tax is an abomination and a fraud. Do everything that you have learned here. Withdraw from the system. It cannot, if enough people withdraw from the system, it will collapse of its own weight. It cannot keep going. But you have to do it correctly. You have to study the books because this is, the situation now is much more dangerous than it was in my time and is much more complex. In fact, my, my friend here, when she began getting involved with this and learned about the income tax, is what, what brought she and I together, was quite in shock for a long time when she learned this and made the decision to take these actions. And she has taken action in all of these areas. And I would like all of you to do the same. She is doing this on my recommendation. And one of the things that is most important to do is tell as many people as you can, wake up people. One of the good things that is about this Congress is that when you come here and you meet speakers that have documentation, have proof, and you can, they won't believe you because it is very difficult for most Americans to believe because they are asleep. If you can wake up as many people as possible, the more people. If you could have a million person march on Washington would be wonderful. If you could do something like that or get something together. But I do understand that in the times that we live in, that may be a very dangerous thing to do. But if everyone will talk to everyone you know and spread the word, spread the tape, spread the information, people must be informed on what has happened. They must know what the government is doing and get this information out. The internet is a wonderful thing, and I think it is wonderful that so many of you are getting these messages across because the people have to be awakened. And I don't know any one way to do it. Thank you. Next question. Welcome, Thomas. Uh, my question is about an incident that took place in Independence Hall prior to the signing of the Declaration of Independence. From my understanding, according to the Ascended Master instruction, there was a gathering of men in the hall preparing to sign the document, but there was hesitancy. And at a precise moment, there was an elderly gentleman in the back who stood up and adamantly shouted, America is destined to be free. And then they all quickly signed the document. Was this uh, St. Germain, or if not, who was this? It was St. Germain. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Earlier, it was discussed about the Declaration of Independence. So my question is, is in relation to the Declaration of Independence, what are your comments about the Scottish Arbroath Declaration and the National Covenant of Scotland of 1635 and James Otis's pamphlet that was printed in Boston in 1774. Could you enlighten me about that? I don't, my memory doesn't. Well, uh, those were treatises that concerned the rights of men. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I was wanting your comments uh, in relationship to those all of these documents are all connected. There have been many who have tried and written about the rights of men. Even way back in history, 
actually there has never been a country that has succeeded in having a fully free country. And it is time for us to do it. And I guess I was foolish to think that we would succeed the first time we tried. But we will keep trying because it is vital for more than one reason. From my perspective now, I see things in a broader viewpoint. And from a spiritual aspect, most people don't realize that I was a very strongly uh, had a spiritual perspective. But the, for the soul to grow, for, this, for us to reach our full potential, which is as we were meant to be, our God created us to be all that we can be and have the freedom to follow our hearts and our inner guidance. In order to do that, we have to live in a free society. We have to be able to live in a way that fits our individual nature, because no two people are alike. So freedom is vital for humanity's growth. Humanity will not evolve if it is not allowed to grow. Thank you. I, I want to butt in for a minute. Uh, were you a member of a church? No. I did not believe in, the only organization I belonged to was a philosophical organization. I did not believe in belonging to anything. Was that the Rosicrucians? No, I, it was the uh, a philosophical society. Oh, it's a discussion group. That's the name of it. All right, yeah. thanks. Next question. Oh, good afternoon. You talked a little bit earlier about Benjamin Franklin. Can you, you, you talked about what he did. Can you talk about the man, the, the quality of his heart? Oh, he was a beautiful man. Next question. Thank you. Beautiful man. Very, very big heart. Mr. President, uh, uh, it's an honor to be able to speak with you, as I'm sure the rest of us are today uh, listening to your words. We would like to find, or you've been, I think, incorrectly stated as that you, in 1803, in the Supreme Court has decided that you wanted uh, religion out of education and religion out of government. Would you set the record straight for us? I did want a separation of church and state, so I'm not sure exactly how you mean that. I think religion is fine anywhere, but one person's religion should not infringe on another. Isn't it true you, you didn't want a specific denomination to right. be the dominant but you certainly wanted religious beliefs and morality to be taught in the schools and in, in our public it institutions. Did not have, no, no, I did not. I believe that is something that should be taught in the home from birth. And if you learn it from birth, then it doesn't need to be taught in school because you already know it when you get there. Okay, thank you. Next one. How familiar were you with Thomas Paine's works and were you oh, at all in communication with him at all? Yes, we were friends. Works? on his writings and such? Oh, yes. We were friends. He was a great man. Do you feel that his work writings were a real important factor? I think they were the most important factor. The most? Yes. Thank you. Hi, I have two questions. Uh, number one, what are you doing currently where you are? And number two, are you intending to come back? And if so, what would you intend to do? Actually, I have come back. I have one or two lifetimes on Earth at the present time, which no one knows about, and I do not intend for them to know about, and they do not know about. Uh, all of those who are willing, who, ha who want to help humanity, many of us in the higher realms, uh, are incarnate on earth at this time, many of not knowing who we are or our purpose, but are all in some kind of service work because the earth is in such a difficult situation now and humanity is in such a difficult situation now. We are talking about the survival of the human race and of the earth more than just this country. So most of us who were here, who were there at that time and who are on the other side, do have one or more incarnations on earth because everyone who is needed, everyone who operates from the heart, who wants service, who want to help humanity, 
do have lifetimes going at this time because we're all needed here. Thank you. Next. Uh, you, um, Thomas Jefferson, you wrote the um, Jefferson Bible, and most people don't even know about it in America, which I think is a total shame. Um, could you please tell us, sort of spe with specifics, what it is that um, you, you felt were lies in the old Bibles? I felt that a lot of the teachings in the older Bibles that taught hellfire and brimstone, I guess you might say, were not valid. I felt that Jesus was the greatest teacher of all time, and his words of love in working together were the important parts. So when I I read several Bibles in the, in the original languages and translated it. The translator has a lot to do with what comes through. So I translated it, his words only, and not the facts of who did what where, but I just translated the part of his words in his teaching because I felt that his, his life became a story, and in the telling of the story, his message was lost, so I separated out the message so that his message of love could be read I on know, its own. Thank I you. know that you have studied uh, very ancient wisdoms and civilizations, mm -hmm. and so could you please tell us what you have discovered about the true Aryans and that we are actually at the basis of um, what is so-called Christianity and the uh, Christus, which uh, originates from the Aryans in India and, uh, and before that from the continent Mu. I did not study that part. I'm sorry. And now in Philadelphia, could you tell us, uh, Thomas Jefferson, because I know you know, where is the pyramid? In, P in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, there is a pyramid. Where? <laughs> I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've uh, given the Time's Up sign, but we're going to fudge into the dinner hour for one more question. I, I really have two questions. When we referred to that treaty that you said you didn't know anything about, mm -hmm. I, I, I wanted to ask the previous speaker, was Thomas Jefferson's name on that treaty? No. Oh. So it's possible that somebody did sign that treaty, but not you. They did, yes. And then would you just comment about John Adams, please? He and I started out, um, we ended up being very good friends and dear friends after retirement. We had disagreements, as I did with many in, in the government, uh, both Washington and Adams. There were three different <coughs> types of beliefs in setting up the government. Washington and Adams believed in a strong central government that would have more, more laws to control the people. Not control, but they felt that the people needed these laws sort of to keep them in, in line or whatever term you want to use. Now, Mr. Hamilton's belief was that he, he, he sort of believed like they do, but he also believed in a central bank because he felt that the common people they carried over this aristocratic elitist idea, and he felt that the people were uneducated and were not able to handle their money, so there should be a central bank as we have now. Um, my feeling was that if the people were not educated, then instead of telling them what to do, we should focus on educating them. So there were many battles behind the scenes on that area, which I lost many of. So there was this uh, disagreement. We were friends to a degree, but our philosophies were uh, very different in many ways. There were a couple of times when the disagreements reached a point where I left and then the, got dragged back. And <laughs> okay. Uh, 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 we, uh, we have utilized the time available. I didn't know it would go so fast. It seems like it just goes so fast when I'm asking questions. Uh, 
but it's been a real privilege to have you here. And is there anything you'd like to finish up with, or any words that you'd rather, that you'd care to say in closing? Uh, I didn't say what I wanted to say about slavery. I had been asked about that. Okay. Uh, I understood that slavery, I did not feel that slavery was right, and I don't and never did. But at the same time, I am a very practical person, and from what I could see and read from history, there was much prejudice, disagreements, slavery had been going on for a long time. Now, I did try, I did put a bill, well, in the original Declaration of Independence, I put in a paragraph about not having slavery, and that created a, that had to be removed or the Declaration would not have been signed. They wouldn't agree on that. So every time there was an opportunity, if you will look back in research, there were several bills in different times that I introduced to abolish slavery. Well, that nobody would agree, so I tried preventing it from being introduced in other states or when the West was opened and in other areas. Uh, they, that was always created turmoil. I agreed in the principle that it should not be. But I also knew that if you want to completely change the world, you cannot do it all at one time. So I had to settle for what I could get accomplished in the time frame and in that lifetime that I had. Also, I was concerned that if we did free the slaves, they were not prepared to support themselves in the world. And as it turned out, if you look back on it now, 220 some odd years later, even in these times, there are still problems. So if it has taken 200 years to get a balance or a relationship in that area, why do people think it could have been done overnight then? I think we did as much as we could and planted the seed, and this is the next step. So I did all that I could do and knew that someday there would be problems from it which have occurred. So even in your time now, it is better, but it is not as, as good as it could be. Let me just say it's been a privilege and a thrill to have you with us today. And I think the rapt attention of our audience speaks for itself and the questions that came up. Thank you. I would like the people to express their appreciation, if they have any, for your being with us today. Thank you. I honor you all. Thank you. And I think that speaks for itself. Okay. Hi. All right. Now she's back, Marilyn Smith. Give her another round of applause, please. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, I got one question for you oh, sure. before people go. Do you remember anything we talked about? Yeah, I'll remember it for a little while. Do I'm you? aware at the time. I, it's sort of like a dream. I remember it. I won't remember it later, but I do remember it okay. uh, for a short time. If you want to know more, she's going to offer a workshop. I don't know when. I've, I've lost my list, but uh, you can find it out front. All right, folks. If you want to get in on some more things on, on uh, predictions and so forth, we start up again at 6.45, I believe it is.